It's such an honor for me to be here. And it's kind of a coincidence that I'm here because yesterday I was asked to speak about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and Kindness to two kindergarten classes here because kindness was the theme of what they've been working on all year, trying to understand this concept and how we can all be kind. When Dr. Monroe uh, came to me uh, and she said, is there a chance you might speak here at the Holocaust? It seemed to me that there really are strong connections between the Holocaust and Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I will just mention to you that one of the things that so impressed me yesterday with the kindergartners that says so much about community day school is that when I showed some video of Mr. Rogers and we talked about what does it mean to be kind, what does it look like, what does it sound like, what struck me most is how the children responded. Five-year-olds, six-year-olds responded with their own ideas, which said to me, what a good place this is here at the day school, where children's ideas matter. And maybe that's why it's so important that you all hear these stories and you all study them and try to understand what the Holocaust was about and what kept us all strong for. So now I'll tell you a little bit about my family story of the Holocaust, which was really an extraordinary one. My parents were born in Lithuania. They grew up there, they went to the Hebrew Gymnasium. They met each other, and in 1936, they decided to get married. And they decided they wanted a better life than they had in Lithuania, so they were going to come to America. My grandfather, my father's father said, oh, I'm, I'm an old man here, I'm happy here in Shavu, I'm going to stay here. He was a grain merchant. He would buy grains from the farmers and then sell them to the merchants. And he said, I'm fine here, you go, make a life for yourself. My mother's sister and brother-in-law said, no, we're going to stay here too, you go, you go to America. So my parents came to America in 1937. They started a life here, and then the war broke out. In 1942, my father enlisted in the army. He knew a lot of languages, he knew German, he knew Russian, and he eventually became a captain in the army. He served in England and in France. Now, what happened in all this meantime is that everybody lost track of their relatives who were in Europe. There was no way you could know who was where. What happened with the ghettos, all the information just got blocked. All the communication was blocked. So nobody knew where their relatives were. When the war ended, it was this big puzzle of how do we find people? How do we find out what happened to them? So my father was in France with his army unit, and a reporter walked into the army base and said he had been talking to some people in, who had been the survivors of Dachau. And there were a lot of Lithuanian Jews who were in that group that he had just met. So my father asked his own army commander if he could possibly go there to see if some of his friends maybe had survived. Everyone heard that those over 50 had been killed because they couldn't work. The Nazis wanted some to be workers, and so my father thought his father had no chance of surviving, but maybe my mother's sister did. So the army commander gave my father a jeep and a driver, and my father came to this place called Feldefink. Feldefink was the Nazi barracks, that's where the Nazis actually lived while they were working at Dachau. And it was a better place after the survivors. They had no place to go, so they all went to this army base of the Nazis for about three months. At that point, my father drove into Feldefink with this jeep and the driver, and he walked up to the gates, 
and there was a whole crowd that came around and said, oh my goodness, there's an American soldier here, an American soldier. And they crowded around him. And I will tell you, my father said that he, many of them were his childhood friends, but he couldn't recognize them because they had been so emaciated, so starved from their time in the concentration camp. And one man called out to my father in Yiddish, Chaim, come, dein Papa is da. Charles, come, your father is here. And my father said, they all crowded around and they started, nobody knew in the barracks, they were just sort of settling into whatever room they could. And they rushed with him and they threw open doors trying to find, where are you, where are you, Israel? And my father said that they, they finally found him in the room with his nephew who had survived with him. These two broken down men who were sitting and they were eating from one plate. And my grandfather in a daze, can you imagine? Can you imagine? My grandfather in a daze looked up and he said, is it day, is it night, are we alive, are we dead? What, what is this? And to see his own son who was coming to rescue him. And um, so that's how my grandfather became actually the first survivor to come to America. My father brought him back to the army base and he stayed there for a while until he got strong enough to come to America. There was a story in the New York Daily News that read, liberated by his son, a U.S. Army captain, one of the first survivors of the horrible Nazi concentration camp at Dachau, was in this country today, a broken man who would only sit and stare and murmur dazedly, why did this all have to happen? What did we do to deserve it? Now, you can imagine coming out of this that my grandfather might have been bitter. He might have been angry. He might have been mean and nasty, saying, why did they do this to us? How could they have done this to us? But that's not, that's not my grandfather. Somehow, through all that he had lived through, through the ghetto, through what this must have meant, not only in Dachau, but the march across the Alps. After, when the Nazis felt the Americans were coming, they took the survivors from Dachau and they marched them across the Alps. Can you imagine the snow-covered mountains with no food, no water, no place, they just slept on the roadside. What happened, interestingly, the third day of that march, the Nazis somehow got word that the Americans were coming and the Nazis fled and these men lying at the roadside of the Alps, looked around and they couldn't believe that they somehow had been freed, and that's how they ended up in Jordan. What's interesting about this story, as I said, my grandfather wasn't a bitter man. He wasn't angry. You know, my grandfather was kind. He was loving, he was caring, and he had a really really strong Jewish faith. How do you come out of this with that kind of spirit? Somehow we get strength from all sides. We get strength from God. We get strength from each other. And there's something in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood that I want to connect this to because I think that's the place where we can all find strength today. Fred Rogers called his program, not Mr. Rogers, but he called it Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Because there is something about what we give to each other. And you know, it doesn't have to be big. Fred Rogers always said, it doesn't have to be anything spectacular to do to make you feel loved or wonderful. It's the little moments. And I'll just read you one of Fred's quotes. Imagine what our real neighborhoods would be like if each one of us offered, as a matter of course, just one kind word to another person. There have been so many stories about the lack of courtesy, the impatience of today's world, road rage and even restaurant rage. 
And sometimes all it takes is one kind word to nourish another person. And think of the ripple effect that can be created when we nourish someone that way. One kind, empathetic word has such a wonderful way of turning to many. I found it just last week as I was thinking about what I was going to say with kindergartners about kindness. I was having some kind of a confusion of some kind of thing that I was writing for the office. And someone at the office patiently helped me work my way through it. And I took that extra moment to write a thank you to her and to say what a pleasure it is working with you because you've been so kind and helpful through this. And do you know what she did? She sent me back an email saying, you have made my day. One little word, little bits of that extra moment of saying thank you. And I, I hope that all of you grow up to be leaders of our world who understand what that means and that you can come through the ups and downs of life knowing how important, what important impact you can make with even one kind word. Thank you.